understand that until it works. Ah, there we go, okay. So, uh, it's a, a pleasure and an honor to introduce the speaker today. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say a lot about Barack's history, because yeah, I guess he's going to talk about his history. Uh, but I'll just give you my own kind of perspective. Uh, <coughs> Parag has been uh, uh, sort of a friend to the Robotics Institute. You know, some people, not me, I'm a really bad alum. You know, I never, I never go to any alum events. I never talk to anybody at my T, which is where I came from. Uh, it pisses me off every time I get a phone call from them asking for money. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, Prague has stayed connected all this time and he's been somebody that's really kind of kept the Robotics Institute connected with uh, the local, um, you know, business community, the startups and, and the other companies that are doing robotics in, uh, in Pittsburgh. So, um, you know, I think it's really a great opportunity to kind of take that relationship and and share it with you all a lot. So uh, thanks, Prague, for coming. Thank and you. Please join me in welcoming Prague. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to warn everyone this talk is not very technical. Uh, I'm mainly going to talk um, kind of about what I've been doing uh, for the last, well, I, I first gave this talk, a uh, version of this talk, five years ago, uh, and then I got older. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about what I've been doing roughly for the past 20 years, uh, and, and, you know, going very quickly over the early stuff, uh, but really what I've been kind of learning along the way um, with an idea or with a focus towards, hey, at some point in my life I decided starting a company was the right thing for me. How did I get to that point, uh, and what, what did I learn along the way, and what have I learned um, in the five years that I've had the company? So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what the company does as well. Um, so step one, um, how did I get where I was at all? I, I got rejected by everybody I wanted uh, to accept me. Um, luckily, I was only 18 at the time, so it was easy to take. Uh, but MIT, Caltech, Stanford, all within a period of about a week and a half, sent me uh, these no's. Uh, I had never really even heard of CMU at the point, so I hadn't applied. This is an undergrad. So. What happened then? I was, again, I, I was 18. Uh, I didn't really learn very much. But I, I, it took a little while to realize this. But I finally got to learn that it's OK to fail. Up to that point, probably like almost everybody here, really hadn't had much experience with failure. Um, probably thought you're a little smarter than maybe you were, uh, although everyone here is extremely smart. Um, but I learned that it was OK to fail. And I also learned that I wasn't necessarily uh, what I thought I was. But that's OK. It let me learn what I wanted to be. Uh, so then what happened? Uh, in 1995, I ended up at the University of Southern California. So today it's actually got a pretty decent reputation. Uh, it, it's, I think, a top 10 or top 15 engineering school. Um, they do really, really cool robotics work there. Uh, but back then, not as much. Um, but it was still really far away from where I grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, got me to the other side of the country. Uh, and it was where I finally started to kind of get a sense that I, I enjoyed robotics. Uh, I fell into a robotics club, uh, or not a club, sorry, the robotics uh, department, part of the School of Computer Science over there. Uh, and I worked with a guy who probably no one here except for Matt has heard of uh, by the name of George Becky. Um, and, and I was very fortunate. Uh, he was an outstanding mentor. I got to work with some great grad students. Um, I, I will ask, does anyone know what that robot in the middle is? Oh, not you, not you. Sorry. One. Close. Uh, no, actually, you're right. That's not the 2000. You're right. Congratulations, yes, very good. Um, and back then, there, we didn't have uh, DJI or 3D Robotics or any of those companies making really cool quadcopters. We were trying really hard to get something like that to fly uh, for more than like a minute at a time. Uh, so that was the state of UAVs back then. But as an undergrad, I got exposed to all kinds of cool things that I never would, uh, who knows what, what would happen, but certainly it wouldn't have been this set of experiences had I gotten into Caltech, MIT, or Stanford. Um, who knows what I would have been working on. So what I learned from that, I was still young. Uh, I, I didn't learn very much. Um, but I did learn that you can kind of do good work anywhere uh, if you care about what you're doing. And, and while USC didn't have the kind of resources that a place like, like one of the other schools had or CMU had, um, the folks there were extremely ingenious. Uh, they had budgets, you know, in the, uh, you know, want to build a UAV? Great. Here's $2,000 Let's for the, for the quarter, for the semester. Let's see what you can do. Um, so it was that kind of work. 
uh, and it also turned into to really learning that hard work pays off. Um, so what happened after that? Uh, I wanted to do robotics and that became clear. So all the grad students there said there's this place in Pittsburgh called Carnegie Mellon and you have to go there. Uh, and so I was very lucky that I applied and uh, something happened back then that would never happen today. I got accepted. Uh, so I, I spent uh, four years in the PhD program and I had great advisors, uh, Chuck Thorpe and Dean Pomerleau. Uh, I hope you've heard of them. Um, if you haven't, somebody here is not doing their job. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not looking at you. <laughs> Chuck was the former director here uh, and Dean was uh, one of the really, really um, outstanding uh, researchers here at CMU. Uh, and, and driverless cars are all the thing now and I know you guys all know that it started here at, well, some people will say it started in Germany. I say it started here at CMU uh, and it started uh, in the early, late 80s and early 90s uh, and so I got to see and be a part of some of that very early work um, working on driverless cars on highways uh, and, and it was a blast. Um, stuff that's only now starting to become commercialized and marketed and becoming uh, popular, um, you know, we were doing here at CMU uh, 20 plus years ago. So from this I really did learn a lot. Uh, and one thing I learned and that I hope a lot of you are taking advantage of is the fact that you are here. Uh, being in grad school and being a PhD student or a master's student can be incredibly stressful. Uh, and I certainly felt a lot of that stress. But I want to uh, encourage you to make the most of your time here. Um, this is probably the most intellectual freedom you will, you will ever have. Uh, the, the really the only time in your life where a, a, a professor will just say, don't worry about the money, just do really cool work. And, and that will not happen after you leave, trust me. Um, it might, but it's very unlikely. Uh, the other thing is, and this is, this is hard to screw up at CMU luckily, is pick good advisors. Uh, I, I think pretty much everybody here uh, in terms of the faculty falls into that category. Um, but I, for me personally, everyone has their own uh, thing about who they work well with and who they wouldn't. I got really fortunate with the advisors that, uh, that I picked, that they, um, they, they were very nurturing, they were very uh, supportive, uh, and, and they really, really helped me grow in a lot of dimensions. Um, and the other thing to realize, uh, and this is really hard, and I, took, and I was told this also way back when, I didn't believe it then, and it took me years to believe it, your PhD is not your life's work, it's just your first work. And it's not going to feel that way while you're working on it. It's going to feel like it is the only thing that matters and your entire career trajectory is forever going to be determined by how well your thesis turns out. Um, when I gave Chuck my thesis, uh, my, my first draft of my thesis document, picked it up, kind of went, yeah, it feels like a thesis. And, and then we scheduled the defense. Uh, so, so where I'm going with that is, um, it is worth doing a good job on your thesis, but it does not, the outcome of that um, does not necessarily dictate the trajectory of what you do in your career later on. Uh, frankly, there is nothing that I do uh, anymore that is remotely related to my PhD thesis. Um, I do nothing in driverless cars. I do nothing in lane departure warning systems. It's kind of neat to be able to say I worked on that back then, uh, but I do completely different things now. And it didn't take me 20 or 15 years to get to doing different things. I was doing different things almost from day one. Um, oh, and the other thing, you all know this, I don't need to tell you this, you will get burnt out. It's just an inevitable, inevitable fact of life. Uh, so what happened after I graduated? Um, I was really tired uh, and I was burnt out and but I needed to find a job because uh, CMU will let you hang out but not forever. So at some point they kick you out into the real world and there was this uh, small startup company called Probotics and they were making, and this is before the Roomba, they wanted to make a robotic vacuum cleaner and this is the base platform there. Uh, it's called the Robot. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Uh, at least some of the older, yeah, okay. Um, and, and it basically pulled behind it a little Bissell uh, um, cordless vacuum cleaner. And so I, I worked with this company, wrote software, path planning stuff, did really cool things. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I lasted four months. Um, so what did I learn from that? Uh, one is don't always take the first job that comes your way, no matter how tired you are. Take the time to do a search. Uh, I really did not want to leave Pittsburgh. Don't be afraid to leave, but make sure you come back. Uh, we don't want anyone to leave forever. Um, the other thing I learned working for a small startup trying to sell robots is people didn't really want robots. Uh, they wanted solutions. And, and again, I think a lot of you know this. Um, but 
there's a whole host of early adopters out there that let a company like Probotics keep going and keep surviving, maybe a little longer than it should have, um, because there are people out there who think it's cool and and who want to um, who want to basically be first adopters. So there were about 2,000 of those robots were sold. And amazingly, there is still a company out there selling them to the educational market. So I don't know what the numbers are today, uh, but this was uh, you know, back in 2000. So now we're looking 15 years later, the company that sells this robot, or a company that sells this robot still exists. Uh, and the other thing that I learned um, is building robots to be used by regular folks, uh, especially someone who just wants a vacuum cleaner is really hard. Uh, uh, and of course, you all know this, small companies are risky. Uh, but this has a happy ending. The founder of this company is a person named Henry Thorne. He went on, transitioned the company to a, uh, another, they pivoted uh, after it was clear vacuum cleaners weren't the way to go, and it become, a became Athon. Athon is still around today. They're selling uh, hospital robotic systems. And some of you may know, Henry's now doing a new company called Four Moms, uh, which is doing amazing things. And it's created a whole new category uh, of technology for robot uh, of applications for robotics, uh, dealing with um, uh, ch uh, children, uh, robotic strollers, self-folding strollers, um, you know, uh, little rocking devices, things like that. Uh, I bought one for, for my first daughter, and, and they're, they're selling some really cool stuff. So you can start a small company, it can fail, and you can still go on to do really cool things. After that, um, so four, uh, graduated from CMU, went out into the real world for four months, realized it was scary, came back to CMU and pounded on the door till they let me back in. Uh, and luckily they did. So I went to the NREC. And uh, this was back, again, around 2000, and I stayed three years there. And I worked for three years on nothing but that robot, and it was a blast. Uh, and that was a, a project that was sponsored by the Toro Corporation to do robotic lawnmowers. Um, oh yeah, I have a, a short video, and I'll just keep talking while the video's going. Hmm. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, you know what? And this will tell you the state of the art of taking videos in 2000 also. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so here we are. We, well, one thing I got to do that was really cool was turn the front yard of the NREC into a uh, one-hole golf course. Um, <laughs> so well, I'm serious. We, we actually designed it, designed the slopes, catted it all up, got a company to come out and do all the landscaping and, and, and seeded it with fairway grass. And uh, the ops folks maintained it. And, and we had our fairway uh, test area out front. Um, and so, yeah, it would have to do things, you know, there's two cameras on it because uh, it had to be cheap. That lawnmower, I think, sold for maybe eight or nine thousand dollars, so we couldn't add, uh, even back then, uh, thousands of dollars of, uh, you know, sensors or no Velodyne on it, that's for sure. Um, so just a couple of cameras. Um, GPS, uh, and it had to go and mow those really precise patterns. Uh, and then we're just playing around, seeing can it work at night? Um, is there really even a business case here? Uh, Toro certainly at the time believed there was, and so funded NREC for about, probably about a total of about five years uh, to do this kind of work. Um, so what did I get from that? Uh, well, one thing, the problem that you sometimes think is going to be the hardest wasn't. We all thought that uh, what was going to be really hard uh, was going to be obstacle detection and not hitting anything on the fairway. Uh, and the easy part was, oh, we just got to go in a straight line. How hard can that be? Um, well, when you've got really, really green grass that's well maintained, finding something on it that you don't want to hit actually turns out not to be that hard, even with really cheap sensors. Again, this is not magic. Keep in mind, this was 15 years ago. Uh, so it was a little more novel then than it would be today, but only a little. Um, but again, we were able to do the, solve the obstacle detection problem uh, very reliably with very cheap sensors and just a, a little bit of smarts in the algorithm. The part that was really hard was to get it to go straight without spending uh, $50,000 on a Novotel Black Diamond GPS IMU system. Uh, and that problem never really got and that's still a problem today, uh, but that problem never really completely got solved. And that's what, in the end, uh, kept this from actually turning into something that Toro wanted to productize. Uh, and one thing that, you know, if you're going to pick a project where you have a lot of field trials, think about where those field trials might be. Uh, given that we were working on golf course lawn mowing, uh, I didn't spend a lot of time at a slag heap. I didn't spend a lot of time at an underground mine, but I saw some really cool country courses, or uh, yeah, country clubs. 
Um, so it's something to consider. Uh, working for three years on one robot is a luxury, uh, especially after you leave grad school. Uh, NREC was a place where we could still do something like that, and, and I hugely appreciate it. Um, and then the other thing I learned was, uh, you know, again, moving away from grad school was actually a little bit of the pressure of getting a system working and learning you know how to manage other people uh, you know being sort of the lead integrator of a pro project um, understanding how long hardware takes and what that means for the software folks who are stuck at the end having to write the code on hardware that hasn't arrived yet um, the software guys always get squeezed if you're a software person I'm sorry if you're a hardware guy try to be nicer um, but it, it's inevitable so what did I do for that? So I spent three years uh, at the NREC and I had a blast. Uh, and then another small company came, opportunity came along. And, and this was uh, started by some folks that I knew from grad school. So it was a little bit less of a risk. I knew what I was getting into. Uh, it was my former advisor and one of his students uh, who had worked on self-driving cars. The company was called Applied Perception. Uh, and I spent a lot of time there. Uh, and we did mostly DOD work, um, SBIRs, uh, if you've heard of that, um, different types of government contract work uh, and I started sort of as just you know a robotics engineer type person uh, in the end I, I was I taken on more of an operations kind of um, sort of running the day-to-day -day of the company uh, um, mode uh, and it was a lot of fun um, and I got to work on a lot of robots and that was really cool uh, everything here was something we did at API uh, whether uh, in the upper left hand corner can't tell the scale but that's that's um, you know it's about a 10,000 pound platform uh, and then we worked on segways and, and we worked on pack bots and talons and um, ATV platforms and gators uh, and other EOD explosive or disposal robots uh, or, over those seven or so years uh, we got, I got to work on a lot of really cool things uh, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so what I learned from there uh, was the importance of having a really solid team and this is where I'm going to start slowly getting into I know some of you guys are going to be thinking I'm, I'm going to graduate either with my master's or my PhD starting is a really good time to start a company uh, what does that mean and how am I going to do it um, one thing having that team of really really good people all of whom hopefully are smarter than you uh, is critically important um, the other thing I learned uh, that I didn't really have to learn until then was the importance of listening to customer needs before speaking uh, it's it's in you know uh, it, it's very easy to think you know a lot of stuff uh, and, and you go in with a solution and you present that solution and it's your baby and you're really happy with it and boy if it's related to your thesis you love it even more um, but it, you know you, you got to listen to what the uh, the customer is saying uh, I got really good at writing losing proposals I got sort of okay at writing winning proposals uh, and it took a long time I wrote a lot of losing proposals before I started writing some that actually uh, were selected um, and I also learned how to work with customers. Uh, and that was really, really, probably the biggest thing I took away from my time at Applied Perception uh, was being the guy in front of the customer, having to justify what I was doing, how I was spending his money, and why I thought what we were doing as a company was going to ultimately benefit him. Uh, and that that's, uh, is something that you never want to forget. And then what happened? Um, so then what happened, what happens with something like called the dark years? Uh, like a lot of startups, startups get sold. It wasn't a startup then. Small companies get sold. Uh, and we got acquired by an organization called Kinetic North America. And Dave, I'm sorry. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, D Dave, Dave joined me there for a, few, a little while, so uh, he remembers. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we got acquired. And that picture is not that different from reality. It's, it's a little bit of an exaggeration. Um, there's sometimes multiple rows of teeth, but it's, it's, it's not that different. So what happens after you get acquired? Uh, you realize that large organizations, and Kinetic was a multi-billion dollar organization, uh, doing amazingly cool things. Uh, they were a, a, a UK-based uh, defense contractor. Uh, they started out of the national labs uh, at the UK Ministry of Defense, got privatized, decided we want to move into the North American market, uh, and did that through acquisition. Uh, so they bought a number of companies like Foster Miller, who makes a Talon robot, and Foster Miller said, oh, we're selling hundreds of millions of dollars of these robots, we need to put autonomy on them. There's like three companies in the US that do autonomy back then, uh, so let's buy one of them, and we were it. So uh, I got to spend two years working at Kinetic, uh, and, and I learned a couple of things. 
Um, one thing, when you're working in a small company, it's really easy to know who your competition is. It's basically everybody else doing anything remotely similar to you. That's your competition. When you're working in a large organization, they're kind of your competition. Sometimes they're your partners. Your real competition is the other division half a building away from you. Uh, and that internal competition is, to me at least, a hundred times worse uh, than the external competition. You know how to deal with external competition. There's all kinds of um, uh, good ways of, of being better, faster, cheaper. With internal competition, it's all about politics. Uh, and if you are the type of person who likes to be in and thrives in a small company, um, dealing with that kind of politics is just something you're not going to be very good at. Uh, and it turned out I wasn't. So um, I lasted about two years, which was about the amount of time that I had to last. Uh, the other thing is um, you get assigned a swim lane. And by that, I mean this is the thing that you are responsible for and need to focus on and, and, and you get evaluated on. Um, be good at that. Don't try to be good at anything else. Uh, and, and that is something that a lot of folks who do well in small organizations have a lot of trouble adapting to because you're so used to wearing so many different hats. You're doing technical work, you're running programs, you're dealing with customers, you're dealing with money issues, I mean, you're dealing with everything. Uh, but then you're, get, you, then you're told, hey, you're actually really good at all these things. I want you to pick one and do just that. Uh, and then I said, I'm sorry, no thank you. So I left. Um, but I did learn some really, really valuable things. I learned how to take a small organization and try to integrate it with a larger organization. Uh, and, and some of the skills that you pick up doing that are, are very, very valuable. The other thing is my role was changing at the time. It was less technical and more business oriented. So I learned a lot about uh, you know, resource management, accounting, budgeting. Uh, Kinetic was very cool in terms of the benefits they offered. I got to pick up an MBA along the way. Uh, so I, I joke a little bit about uh, some of what happens after um, you get acquired by a large organization, but uh, if you find yourself in that situation, you will see opportunities as well. And you should make sure to grab those opportunities for whatever time you have to be in that large organization. Um, so here's where I am today. I started a company in 2009 called Nea Systems. Um, we're up, up to uh, about 25 people right now. Uh, we're right up in Wexford, not too far from here. Uh, we've got a few remote employees. We've got about three people in Denver and then uh, uh, one person each in Minneapolis and Huntsville. We focus primarily on outdoor robotics, um, mainly on doing things uh, that push state-of-the-art autonomy, uh, navigation in highly unstructured ter terrain, uh, multi-robot collaboration, and control between UAVs and UGVs, uh, developing hardware for EOD platforms, and I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, we've had some success. We've been growing steadily. Um, I started in 2009, hired first employee in 2010, uh, and kind of kept growing right after that. Uh, in 2014, uh, Inc. Magazine put us on their Inc. 5000 list as the 655th fastest growing company in the country. Uh, last year we stayed on the list. Uh, you know, our, our ranking went down, but we still stayed on the list uh, at 2098. Uh, and the second fastest private growing, uh, private robotics company uh, in terms of growth. Uh, Fast Company named us one of the top 10 most innovative companies in robotics uh, this year, so that was really cool. Um, and, and so yeah, we, we've, had, uh, we've had some success. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of what we've been doing, uh, and after that I'll talk a little bit about some of the lessons I learned, which hopefully will be useful for, for you guys uh, if and when you decide to do your own thing. What are our core technologies? Um, excuse me. We focus a lot on, I'm going to hit the top one last. We focus a little bit on platform technologies, board level solutions, hardware. We're about 80% software, but there's a very important 20% of, uh, of hardware that we do uh, as well. And, and I'll get into some detail on that. But we, we know how to optimize computer vision algorithms to run on FPGAs. We know how to develop um, really, really low power uh, uh, autonomy systems that can be integrated on very small 10, 20 pound platforms. Uh, and we understand how to do vision algorithms in extremely constrained environments. When you're working with construction companies and auto companies, uh, they tell you what hardware you're going to use and you have to make your stuff work on that. It doesn't go the other way around. Um, we do a lot, re really our bread and butter uh, is perception, machine learning and navigation. Um, we do a lot of terrain classification and object recognition uh, and um, dynamic modeling. Uh, of wheel placement for off-road navigation. I'll show a couple of videos of that. Um, we do some stuff in mission management. Uh, how do you make uh, 
small squads of uh, unmanned systems do something intelligent. Uh, not at the swarm level, more at the, hey, I've got a, um, uh, you know, 10,000 uh, acre open pit mine that I've got to survey once a week. We can't do that with a, f you can't really do it well with a fixed wing aircraft. Uh, you can't really do it at all with a single uh, quad rotor. What kind of coordination collaboration do you have to do so that if you have a fleet of systems, uh, you can uh, deploy them, collect the data, analyze that data, and present that data. Uh, so we de we've developed an infrastructure and framework for that and are working with uh, companies to, uh, to deploy that. Um, and then finally, uh, open architectures. And this is something you will probably not really see very much uh, as part of your graduate work uh, or as part of your time at CMU, um, except you have and you may not realize it. I'm sure a lot of you use, a lot of you use ROS. Uh, it's extremely popular. Uh, and it is a canonical example of what an open architecture is. Uh, it means that you might want to keep the core algorithms proprietary, although ROS doesn't, I get it, but companies like to do that. Uh, but they want their interfaces and APIs to be wide and open so that it's easy to adopt. Uh, it's great from a company standpoint because it allows you to talk about uh, avoiding vendor lock-in, which customers like to hear. Customer like, customers like it because it gives them choice. Uh, they can buy the best uh, mission planner from this company, the best um, you know, object recognition system from this company, the best uh, maneuver planner from that company, and ideally integrate it all together. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a dream and a vision, um, but uh, at least in working with the DOD, that's the direction they're headed in. And so we've been, um, uh, we've developed a business model around that that's been very successful for us. Uh, in, in terms of a little more just some pictures of what we do. Um, top left is some mission planning tools that we've developed. Uh, we've worked with um, putting autonomy on large helicopters. Uh, that's a KMAX platform. We've done long range uh, range clearance systems, teleoperated the red robot there in the middle. Uh, we work on uh, Humvees uh, and smaller gators. A little bit hard to see in here with the light. I'll show some of the UAV stuff we do. Um, we, for a 25 person company, work across a very broad range of robotics uh, and there is a strategy there and I'll talk about that also. Uh, a little bit in terms of the autonomy, because that might be of interest to folks. Um, so we do things like waypoint navigation, nothing super complex there. Uh, but we work in structured and unstructured terrain. Uh, I would say the piece that we're really good at, um, that, that we hang our hat on a little bit, uh, is our trajectory and maneuver planner. So we've got a, um, a, a receding horizon based uh, trajectory planner uh, and lattice based maneuver planner that, that work together that allow a vi wide variety of unmanned ground vehicles to navigate in extremely unstructured environments uh, and really get through tight places, uh, really um, you know, deal with multi-point turns, deal with uh, the dynamics of, hey, can I, if I'm bouldering, can I put my wheel on this rock or am I going to risk my axle if I do that? Do I have to put it on this rock? How do I get around that? Uh, I got trapped in a, a cul-de-sac. Uh, how do I execute the multi-point turns necessary to get out? Uh, and we've developed that in a way that can be rapidly adapted to a broad range of unmanned ground vehicles and so we've demonstrated in a lot of different platforms all the way from small things like the the logger bots that some of you might have seen uh, they hang around NREC still I think um, uh, all, all the way up to the you know to Humvees and, and platforms of that scale uh, so I'm just going to show again a quick video it's going to start out with simple things and then get to things that are a little more interesting Maybe it paused. So we're going to start out with simple stuff. Um, so what's happening here? Humvee's driving on a you know on a dirt road. Uh, there's no road following going on. It's purely with stereo. Uh, there's the only thing given to you is a GP a final GPS goal point. There's no GPS based navigation, no active perception. Um, so it is using stereo to uh, build a world model and then uh, plan in that world, uh, both through a combination of uh, trajectory, you know, trajectory and arc uh, generation, uh, and and again this lattice-based planner. Um, this just shows you the internal state of the system. This is from about a year and a half ago. Uh, we're not allowed yet to show the latest and greatest uh, until we put that through public release. Um, so we're, we're, we're somewhat beyond this right now. Uh, and again, what you're seeing here, this, pe th this sort of thing also, lots of people do on-road, 
videos that freeze um, on road obstacle uh, avoidance. Let's see. Oh, that's interesting. There we go. I think the next clip is where it starts to get. Let me go through this also. Yeah, so now we're starting to reason about understanding the geometry of the rocks, understanding where we can place the wheel. Um, we don't go over the big rocks, even though if we'd gone straight, we would have. We go over the smaller ones. The whole idea here is to minimize uh, jolt in the z-axis. Uh, doing the same thing on slope terrain, where perception is a little bit more challenging. So everything you're seeing here, we're doing now in denser terrain at faster speeds. Uh, and I hope I can, well, yeah, I hope I can post that on YouTube pretty soon. Another area, uh, as I mentioned, that we work in a lot is um, collaboration control for multiple robots. Uh, basically, we think of it as fleet management for unmanned systems. Um, we started working on this with unmanned ground vehicles. We're doing a lot more with unmanned air platforms now because that's kind of where the action is. Uh, and sort of the, the idea that we're pushing is that right now, uh, commercially, it's very hard to fly even one UAV. Uh, you have to get an FA Section 333, uh, 333 exemption. Uh, it's very limiting in what you can do. You have to have a private pilot at the control still. Uh, sooner or later, that will become uh, those regulatory barriers will, will drop uh, and, and it'll become easier uh, and at that point you can start thinking about what can you do with multiple uh, unmanned air vehicles and so we've got a, uh, a system that uh, that allows us to collaborate control deal with mission planning for uh, multiple vehicles um, we demonstrated on a KMAX platform on a casualty evacuation scenario uh, earlier this year and I'm gonna just with Lockheed Martin and uh, Command Aerospace. Um, what was interesting here is we were doing a live demo uh, with the helicopter, which you'll see in a bit, and um, we had about a week to prepare for it uh, at Command's facility in Connecticut. Um, and we had about 40 people coming in, uh, mostly from DC, mostly program managers, PEOs, program executive officers, folks who are kind of at a mid to high level in the DOD who were interested in seeing this. Uh, and the weather was great. Every single day we were setting up and practicing. And then the weather got horrible. It was pr forecasted to be horrible the day uh, of the actual flight demo um, to where uh, we wouldn't have been able to fly. Uh, so this video, uh, the Lockheed guys, they, they brought a whole, one of the nice things about a big company is they can bring an entire crew of people just to take a video uh, and they can take that video and then they can stay up till three in the morning and in the span of about eight hours put together a professional video uh, that's well beyond anything that we as a small company could do. Um, luckily we ended up not needing it because uh, the weather did clear that day um, but basically what you're seeing is a, is, a, is a little bit of a contrived scenario casually on the battlefield is examined by the unmanned ground vehicle um, that goes back to an operator with a tag tablet, the t guy, the, the medic assesses the condition, uh, says the casualty evacuation is, is required. Uh, the KMAX helicopter uh, is called from the, by the medic with the tablet uh, and is deployed. So right now that's flying autonomously. Uh, there's a safety pilot on board, of course, um, and it's heading towards uh, the uh, GPS location of the casualty. Um, and then it'll land, he'll be picked up and taken back and uh, we're not allowed to fly with real people as casualties, so we use a dummy. Um, that's not, yeah. You'll see why in about a minute after you see what we do with the, uh, the mannequin. <laughs> I'll make sure this hasn't frozen. Yeah, I did it again. Yeah, so you don't want to be that guy. <laughs> Although if you're hurt badly enough, you might not care. So um, we were very clear in doing this that this, you know, this, this was a notional recovery mechanism uh, and not how you would really do it. Uh, but the whole idea was to demonstrate single tablet-based control, multiple unmanned vehicles for a militarily relevant mission. Then you can take the same software and pay a, a video company here in Pittsburgh way more money than you think you need to or should to 
basically put together what I will call purely a marketing video. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this is because it's important to understand the importance of marketing videos. Uh, and by marketing videos, I mean things that are different than, hey, the robot's doing something cool. Uh, it's more about uh, something you can show at a trade show that a guy with an actual application can look at and go, wow, cool, robots, and it's doing something I kind of understand. Uh, and, and that's sometimes hard to do. Uh, and this, but then you got to have a little bit, just just like a lot of conference papers, you got to have enough math in there to make it look like you're actually, you know, doing something uh, really cool. Um, but then you got to have pretty pictures as well. Uh, and so here again, we're, we're, what we're showing is uh, single tablet control, two commercial quadcopters. One is made by Aztec in Germany. The other is uh, just a 3D Robotics uh, X8, flying different patterns. Uh, you know, um, notionally to survey, uh, you know, like a seven acre plot of land. Um, we can go from that. It flies, it flies for a while. Uh, if the audio is on, you'd be hearing some very cheesy music as well. Um, but what's interesting about this is there really aren't folks right now. There, if you look at the UAV space, there are lots of people building platforms uh, in every dimension of size, payload capacity, uh, power type, uh, number of propellers. Y you plot all that into one big multi-dimensional uh, grid uh, and you will find a company in every you know, quadrant of that space. Uh, and, and we're not trying to do any of that. There's too many people in that space. We're focusing more on the software that runs on top of it. Again, with this sort of notion of an open architecture of an SDK that that makes it really easy to take a certain level of mission planning and collaboration and data sharing and put it on different platforms that are commercially available. So we're not trying to sell you a platform. Uh, think of it much more like you know an enterprise management system where uh, what we sell is a license to use this uh, along with uh, non-recurring engineering to adapt it to your, um, to your uh, application. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about, at least technically, and this is a big deal for us, uh, we just found out two weeks ago that we were selected as a supplier for what's called a program of record. Uh, that's DOD speak for really big money. Um, and, and what that means is uh, you guys are used to sort of contract R&D. Um, people do that here at CMU. They do that in commercial organizations. Write a proposal, get grant money. Uh, but what happens when you're trying to build the F-15 or an F-35 or an M1A1 or something like that, that's called a program of records, congressional, a, a line in the congressional budget that says that there is this much money allocated towards doing this uh, or building the F-15. Um, so there is a program of record called EDRIS, the Advanced EOD Robotic System. It's the next generation in explosive ordnance disposal robots. Uh, it's been on it's been going on for about eight years. Uh, and, and finally, the uh, awardee for this contract got announced uh, two weeks ago. It was north of Grumman, uh, out of Huntsville. And we're a subcontractor and supplier to them. Um, and, and this is about a half a billion, not for us, but it's about a half a billion dollar contract. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a large, large effort. Uh, and what's really cool for the region, it, and I can't go into the details of who, uh, but besides us, there are two other Pittsburgh organizations that are involved as key suppliers to this program. Program. So of that half a billion dollars, somewhere five to ten percent, I would guess, uh, possibly more, will end up at, with Pittsburgh companies. Uh, so I think it's a great thing for the region. Uh, and if you look at, you know, over the next five years, total dollars that'll come from this, um, it might rival Uber in what they're doing as well in terms of just scale and scope. Um, and so, but the cool, what we're doing, what are we doing for this? We're building that little tan box, uh, and that's about it. So what sits inside of that box is really simple autonomy, waypoint following without any obstacle avoidance, just plain GPS waypoint following, uh, and um, basically three axis manipulator control. Uh, fly the gripper for a really simple arm. Nothing complicated in terms of the autonomy. Um, what is difficult is that it's got very hard, hard uh, size, weight, and power requirements. It's got to fit in onto that robot. Uh, it's got to work in very extreme conditions uh, and it's got to have very high reliability. Uh, so that's where the challenge is. Uh, and for a software company like us, that's a brand new challenge and one we're really excited about. Um, so we're expecting between 2000 and 2000, uh, 2017 and 2021 uh, to sell anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 of these units uh, to the Navy. Um, the Army and Air Force are still notionally involved as well and, and maybe buying uh, additional um, units also. So this is 
for a small company like us, a lot of times companies like us will say, you know, we, we want to start working with uh, writing contracts and getting grant money and doing R&D, and then we want to transition to products and selling stuff. Uh, and sometimes that happens and sometimes that doesn't. In this case, we've been fortunate uh, in that it's going to happen. Um, and, and so we're really excited about that. Uh, it, it's actually a huge deal for us. Uh, and we're going to be hiring um, next year quite a bit uh, to help staff this program up. So, with that said, what's next? Uh, we're growing. Um, we are transitioning from DOD. I have not talked at all about what we do on the commercial side, largely because it's a little bit more difficult for me to talk about. Uh, but we do quite a bit of work with commercial organizations as well, some here in Pittsburgh, some outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, and, and, and we're going to be increasing product sales. Uh, we are hiring. Um, there's a lot of things I can talk about uh, if anyone's interested, but I won't make that spiel or pitch here. Um, so what have I learned in the last five years uh, of, of running NEA? Um, probably the biggest, uh, well one of the biggest is customer engagement. And, and I kind of hinted at this before when I was talking about time at applied perception. Um, talking to customers is hard, uh, but it's essential. Um, but it is a skill you can learn, and it's a skill I had to learn. I'm naturally very introverted, and that's not uncommon for CMU uh, well, most grad students, I would say. Uh, it, and, and I had to practice at extroversion and giving talks and being comfortable in those types of situations. And it does not come easy for me. Um, a, a, as an example, uh, we do these cookouts every week bar, uh, a, at the company. Um, and uh, we were doing a cookout, and the uh, company next door was doing some remodeling. So the, the uh, construction workers were over there. We had a lot of extra food. So I, I went to one of my guys and I said, uh, hey, why don't you, you know, ask them, if, see if they want any uh, extra hot dogs or hamburgers. And, and he didn't mean this in a smart aleck way or, or, or anything like that, but he's like, you, you, Prague, you're right next to them. Why don't you ask them? <laughs> and, and my reply was, I use up all my extroversion keeping this place running. Um, and, and where I'm going with that is, uh, there is some truth to that, and, but you shouldn't let that scare you from doing something that requires you to be a little bit of an extrovert. Uh, because talk is a skill, and you can learn it. And there are some people who are just inherently good at it. I am not one of them. Uh, many of you may not be, but that's completely OK. And that absolutely does not need to stop you from being successful at starting and running a company. Um, the part that is easy for introverts is to always listen. Uh, and and yeah, usually it's easy. Sometimes we have to learn that as well. Um, but, but listen, try to solve their problem. Again, don't try to push your solution. Uh, the other thing, and, and this may sound obvious because everyone likes to get good customer service, but giving good customer service is hard. And especially in robotics, uh, we are, many of us are very, very good at what we do. And so there's this notion of, and, and I think it's a little bit less now than maybe it was uh, when there were fewer people uh, in the field where, hey, we, we build robots and if you need one, you have to come to us. I don't know where else you're gonna go. Um, so I get to kind of behave that way and that doesn't work. It really doesn't. And, and we found a lot of success uh, at NEA um, by really being cognizant of the fact that a little bit of humility uh, goes a long way. Paying attention to the customer goes a long way. Uh, and not pretending you know everything is generally very much appreciated. Uh, and, and what's really cool, uh, at least for us, um, is a lot of our competitors still don't seem to get that. And they have this little bit of arrogance, little bit of um, uh, self-aggrandization, uh, excuse me, um, that, that they use. Uh, and and we, when we can, try to take advantage of that by not being those guys. Um, Always think ahead of deployment. Uh, there, you may just want to build an R&D company, and that's fine. Uh, there are times and days where I think that's the easiest thing for us to do also. But I really want to get things out into the world, and, and that does take a, a lot of thought. Um, one thing, and this is a little tricky, is know how your customer likes to buy things. Because uh, different customers buy things in different ways. Um, the DOD, they love buying R&D. Uh, they love buying services. It's really hard to get them to buy a product, amazingly enough. Unless you're Microsoft and you're selling copies of Word. Uh, but if you're trying to sell uh, a product to the DOD, that, that takes an, literally an act of Congress. And I, don't, I mean that literally takes an act of Congress. Um, but if, you're try, if you just want to do R&D and you want to do IRAT, internal uh, research and development, the DOD is a great place to go. 
Industry is the exact opposite. If I went to uh, a large company like you know, John Deere, Caterpillar, and said, give me $3 million so I can study a cool problem and do some research, uh, you can probably all guess what they'll tell me. But, but, but if I go to them with a product, a box that does something cool, they just say, all right, I, we like it. We like the price. Who do I send a purchase order to? So, so what's interesting is you actually can use the Department of Defense to seed your research and development and turn that into products that you then sell to commercial organizations uh, and the DOD makes that very friendly in some ways B and if anyone's interested feel free to contact me in terms of how do they do IP and data rights and things like that um, and the other thing to do is to understand budget cycles and who makes spending decisions uh, you can spend a lot of time talking to somebody who has no purchase authority at all uh, but they might know somebody who does or they might be one level removed so it's not necessarily time wasted but you want to make sure you're in that chain what else? Uh, hiring is extremely important uh, and hiring well. Um, a lot of books say hire slow, fire fast. Um, I will say that that is easy to say and really hard to do uh, and I've made that mistake uh, and I probably will make it again because it's, it's just really hard to do. Uh, but you should take the time to make sure whoever you're hiring is a good fit. Uh, especially in a really small company, one bad hire can be disastrous. Uh, and we did have that happen to us. Uh, it was somebody who came recommended by a couple of folks that I knew really well. Uh, it turned out they hadn't worked with this person as closely as maybe I thought or they thought uh, and it just turned out not to be a good fit. It took a year before I really was comfortable enough to, to take action on that. Um, the other thing and I hinted at this, uh, always hire people who are smarter than you. Uh, this is really really important. I'm now proud to be probably the dumbest guy in my company uh, and that is I, I cannot emphasize the importance of that. Um, you as a founder or an owner of a company do not want to be the guy who has to solve all the problems you'll fail um, here's what I look for in an employee and, and this you know it's, it's obviously cultural fit um, uh, of course, strong technical knowledge, uh, but I like to see evidence of, of outside interests, of hacking, you know, pe people who like to build things on their own. Uh, that always tells me, you know, something very important about their character and uh, and, and what they like to do. Um, Ideally, I like to get a reference from somebody I really trust. Uh, most of the time, that works out pretty well. The bigger you get, the harder that becomes because you go through your contacts and, and the people you know pretty quickly. Um, but the other thing that's really important is we do group interviews. We make sure candidates meet almost everybody in the company. Uh, and the existing employees have to really, really want to work with that person. Uh, we have certain rules, no jerks. Um, that rule is referred to in a different way, which I won't, but uh, no jerks allowed. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the other people we hire have to really want to work with that person. Uh, company culture is really important and probably uh, one of the things, I, that and hiring are the two things I spend a lot of time on. Um, and you have to pay active attention to it. Uh, but there's no one right answer to it. It's whatever culture works for your organization and you as a leader and your personality. Our cultural our culture tends to be very entrepreneurial. I actually have employees who own other companies. Not in robotics, I kind of draw the line there. Uh, but they do own other companies. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my guys on my leadership team, uh, he and his wife own uh, a company called Excel Gymnastics. They are the second largest gym school, like tumbling, gymnastics school in Western PA. Uh, it's huge. It's actually bigger than my company. I should be jealous. I should be doing that. Um, but, you know, he gets, uh, he gets a lot of satisfaction from doing it, uh, he and his wife, and they're really successful at it. And yet he's still awesome uh, at my company. Uh, very, uh, taking ownership, I, I know, has been very important uh, to the employees. Um, and and that, that's great because everyone has a lot of, they, they really care deeply about what they're doing. But it can be difficult to manage at times. Um, we're very collaborative. We don't have politics. If you're a 25-person company and you have politics, something is going drastically wrong. Uh, and the, the commercial centricism that I mentioned early, earlier, that's really the only area that didn't grow organically that I, that I had to push on. We're getting to the end. Uh, leadership, um, less is more. Try to stay out of the way. Uh, but do take the time to be aware of what's going on with everybody and what they're doing and working on. Uh, the one thing that's going to be hard is that you kind of always have to be positive. Um, it's not good to, to portray cynicism or negativity. Um, even when it's hard, even when you're feeling it, you will feel it. Um, but, but you, you, you got to kind of bottle that up a little bit. Um, and that employees want ownership, but that ownership does not have to be in the form of stock options or whatever you think may be uh, the sort of traditional way. We have some very non-traditional ways of, of offering ownership. 
Uh, second to last slide, bootstrapping versus venture capital. Uh, there is crazy money in robotics right now. Uh, most of you know this, so it is going to be really easy for most of you to go out there and say, I have a decent idea, give me millions of dollars. And, you, and, and for better or for worse, you'll probably get millions of dollars. Uh, it doesn't mean you should do that. Um, my personal belief, for your first company, spend your own money, not somebody else's. You're gonna learn a lot more by doing it that way, even if that company doesn't succeed. Uh, it is much harder. You will be much more disciplined about cash flow. Um, however, once you get past that hurdle and you're generating revenue and you are profitable, if you decide to go after external funding, it is so much easier. Uh, we are now in a position where we get calls on a weekly basis from uh, venture capital, other companies that want to do minority investments that want to invest. We're not taking any external money right now because it's not right for us. Um, but if we wanted to, I know the terms that we could negotiate uh, would be very, very different than maybe what we could have done four or five years ago. Uh, and the other thing this is important to me, may not be important to you, uh, by being the sole owner and bootstrapping, I don't have a board sitting on top of me forcing me to do things that I think are wrong uh, or will take the company in a direction I don't want it to or force me to grow at a rate that I think is unsustainable. There are exceptions. Um, if you're, if you're doing something that's really, really hardware intensive or capital intensive, that's hard to, to bootstrap and you need to go and get money for that. Uh, and, and of course, you know, depending on your business model, you may want to just buy growth uh, like Uber is doing. Um, but you guys are not Uber. So uh, I'm going to cross that one off the list. Here's what's been hard, the very last slide. Uh, getting good advice and mentoring has been really hard. Uh, so I will make this offer. For any of you who are thinking of starting a company, um, Matt knows how to get a hold of me. I would be happy to talk to any of you. Um, growing beyond R&D has been difficult. Um, the project to people ratio has been difficult. Uh, we are always a little bit understaffed because I'm really, really careful about, not only because I'm careful about hiring, because I don't want to hire somebody and have to lay them off six months later. So we kind of wait till we're, okay, we really, really need three people. Let's hire one or two. Um, the small projects and new customers versus existing customers and, and keeping them happy is always difficult. What do you take? What do you not take? Uh, we were a little unique in that we started working in the DOD uh, market area on the budget the, the business cycle there is very long. Um, you can write a proposal and not see a dollar of revenue from that for 12 to 18 months. And as a small company, that can be really hard to manage. Um, now we're getting to the point of having potentially more opportunities than availability uh, of people. And, and uh, you know, what do we chase? What do we take on? What do we turn down? Um, and, and then the other thing, this, this won't apply to a lot of you, but uh, if you're working with the government, boy, they put a lot of processes on you. And you got to follow all of them. And if you don't, you might go to jail. So. Um, I guess I'll leave it with that. Uh, <laughs> um, my contact information is up here. Uh, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to uh, talk to any of you. But thank you very much for your time and attention today. You have time for some questions? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy sure to. There are probably quite a few. Yes. Yeah, two quick sure, sure. The first one is, uh, when you're developing a product, uh, at, what point, at what point do you feel it's good enough? and Ever. for you to launch it in the market. Um, that's one. And the yep. second is regarding raising money. So you ne you've not raised money till now, right? Correct. And uh, so uh, you know, how do you perceive that part? And uh, is it like some kind of fear of losing control? Uh, and question. yeah, so could you just yeah, yeah. throw some light on that? Uh, so the first one I'll answer, um, a lot of people say do the quick releases, you know, the, the, the quick iterative cycle. Yeah, minimum viable product, all of that. I, I firmly believe in that. Uh, I'm not saying we've been good at that or that we've done it, but I firmly believe in it. Um, so I would recommend it uh, as really the right way to do it. Uh, because of the type of stuff we've done, our stuff has been a little bit more baked before we've shown it to customers. Uh, and maybe we've actually lost some opportunities that way. Um, as far as the, the money goes, uh, it is probably a little bit of a control thing. Um, and, and also, I know for me personally, Personally, I don't want to run a hundred or two hundred or three hundred million dollar company. Uh, not only is it really hard to do that to get to that scale, I don't think it'd actually be very enjoyable for me personally. So, um, for me, being at that, you know, we're 25 people now. We have a great culture. We have a great team. If we're 50 people, I can still see that being kind of the same. Uh, if we're 100 people, maybe. Uh, but once we get too far beyond that, the tenor of the company changes very uh, a lot. And even if we grow that much organically, I would probably bring in somebody else to run the company at that point. Sorry. Hope that answered your question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I, I have two questions. Sure. Why the name? Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, well, when I started the company, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, so I, I mentioned I was working for this Kinetic uh, North America large organization. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I didn't want to be there anymore. So I left. Uh, but it was without having a business idea or a company or really anything in, in mind. Um, so I had to come up with a name. I thought I was going to do robotics, but I wasn't sure. Uh, I didn't want to call myself United Defense Amalgamated Robotics Inc. or something, you know, really, really DOD-ish. Uh, NEA means new or innovative in Hindi, although I spelled it wrong, I know that. Um, and so I just I picked that as a placeholder, and it stuck. So. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. Yes. So uh, I see you have Twitter account. Oh, yes. <laughs> How does social media marketing help you? Um, I'm not convinced it does. Uh, I, I do post on a little bit, um, mainly because everybody I know does. Uh, so we don't do Facebook. We do LinkedIn a little bit more. Uh, LinkedIn has been actually very valuable for finding people, uh, especially as we've grown. I spend a lot of late nights uh, trolling LinkedIn, basically, uh, looking, for, looking for candidates and, and just cold emailing them. Uh, so, but it works. You tell your own employees they can't get on <laughs> No, they're all on LinkedIn. And they get, they get opportunities and recruited every week and, and I know that uh, and one thing I'm immensely proud of is we have lost no one to a competitor uh, we've had a couple people leave because they one wanted to go become a lawyer career change life change uh, we had another person leave uh, actually my very first employee which hurt a little bit um, because he wanted to uh, go work for an internet startup um, but ended up uh, after about eight or nine months changing his mind and just came back about a month ago uh, so yeah we, we've been very good at retention and I've been really happy about that. Um, but uh, to your Twitter question, uh, you know, there, there are times I think, ooh, I got to get stuff on Twitter, and then I just stop for like months at a time. So, yeah. Yes. But follow me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. You said you, know, you don't like to work in a big company because of the politics going on there and uh, because you, you would like to sleep in multiple legs at the same time. And so, but do you think if there's anything you could learn in a big company that you can learn in a small company? Uh, absolutely. Is, it, it, is there anything you could you might possibly improve? Uh, I mean, improve if you had worked in a, a big company. Um, I, so I think what really helped me spending a couple of years at, at a large organization uh, was learning the business processes and operational side uh, and the budgeting that you have to do to be successful and the cash management and all the things that um, I got to learn by watching it happen in another organization um, that I, you know, I didn't have to experiment on my own. Uh, so, and you get a different perspective of that in a large company than in a small one. So I think sort of the operations management aspect of things uh, was hugely useful. And I know it's helped me uh, help the company succeed, that, that experience did. Yes. Yeah, please. So uh, you mentioned that your employees have their own setups, uh, except in robotics. Yeah, a couple of cases. They don't all have their own companies, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you manage it? Um, I trust them to get their jobs done, and they haven't failed. Uh, it's sometimes, you know, we do set some guidelines and boundaries. Um, when the person uh, who bought the gym, um, basically, it was going to—it was a huge multi-million-dollar deal, right? It was a huge commitment, uh, and so, but he was valuable enough to me and important enough to the company that I worked with him. And I said, look, if you want to take every month, you want to take a week off to get your hands wrapped around this gym, and for a year, you want to go down to 75%, essentially. We'll work with you to do that. Uh, I would not do that for everybody. It, it was a uh, you know a little bit of a special case, um, but y you know it can work. Yeah. In my opinion, that's really exceptional. Uh, it, you know, if someone came to me and said I was starting a tech company or something that even had the potential of, of bumping up against what we do, probably have a different answer. But a gym, you know, I mean, it's really cool. So, uh, sorry, I thought I think I saw your hand, but then yes. Uh, is there any problem? I'm sorry, any problems with what? Uh, your, your, your startup phase, uh, which could potentially break your company, yeah. but you put it together. Yes, so yeah, I think you're asking, could something have gone horribly wrong that would have uh, tank the company. Um, I mentioned we, we had a hire that didn't work out very well. Uh, I waited way too long to take action on that. Um, and he was working on one of our very first 
programs at the time. Uh, it was a relatively small program, uh, but it had a lot of public visibility. We were going to a competition. Other people were going to be in that competition, including CMU NREC, including uh, SRI, including iRobot, uh, and, and nobody heard of us at this time. We needed to do well at this competition. I put a person in charge of it who wasn't ready for that role, uh, and I waited too long to, to fix that. Uh, not only did I lose a lot of money that we really couldn't afford at that time, um, I had to take other people who were working on projects that were going well and say, hey, I'm sorry, for the next two months, you have to rescue this. Uh, so I, I messed up there badly by not um, taking much, much faster action. Uh, and we got lucky. And, and other people really saved us because of the work they did to, to get us through. So uh, I think you had a, and then you. Um, I guess about in the early stages, how do you um, start, take your idea and then get your first customer and get the first person to buy it? Uh, yeah, um, I don't have a pat answer to that. Uh, I think we were, we were a little different that we're not, we were not product centric. So I wasn't, I wasn't creating an app, I wasn't building a, a, a hardware box and putting it on a website. Uh, I started the company when I was 37, so I was a little bit older. Uh, and so I had contacts in the defense department, previous customers I'd worked with, people that even if my company wasn't known, uh, they had some familiarity with me as an individual. So when I was writing proposals, uh, that's where we got very lucky. We won some of our early proposals. Uh, and I think had we not won those, things would have gone in a very different direction. So it's a little bit different than the question you're asking, but that's what happened for us. Well, that, that is sort of my question is, basically is like, proposals a good way to sort of, and like you said, the competition, stuff like that, is that good ways to sort of get name recognition? And um, for me personally, the recognition, or at least the familiarity with the customers that I have now, came from all the, the work that I was doing over the, the 10, 15 years prior, and it took that much time to build that up. Um, I would not recommend someone trying to build the kind of business we built when they're just coming out of school uh, because it's a, it's a different model. Um, I think the model that's a little riskier but frankly has a better chance of success is the, hey, uh, you know, at, as a grad student, I did this really cool thing. Now I see a commercial application for it. Uh, I'm going to go live in my parents' basement for the next six months, turn it into a product, and go bang on doors. Um, or you could go and get the millions of dollars from San, San Jose. I know that. Uh, you, you can do that as well. Uh, but th that is probably really the, uh, there's a huge amount of luck involved. Uh, for us also, there's a huge amount of luck involved. Sorry, guys, please. Do you think the trajectory of a company uh, like yours, or maybe one that's a little bit more hardware focused, would change if they had uh, an open source uh, for their software policy? Would that, is that company sustainable? Um, I haven't found too many yet that have been. Um, Red Hat's a canonical example uh, of success. Uh, you know, the Ross folks are doing reasonably well, but they're getting DARPA funding, which is what's keeping them afloat. Um, we do open up our interfaces, the things that allow you to connect to our software, the APIs, the library calls, all of that. We give that to the government, free and clear. We give it, we can make it available commercially. We have a few things that we release completely open source um, because they help the community grow and they aren't core to our business. Uh, but the stuff that's core to our business, I've not found a good way to really open source any of that. You think that would have, I mean, in a hypothetical situation that you had done that for whatever reason, would that have submarine your company's success? Um, I don't know. On, on the one hand, uh, the stuff we and a lot of us do is, is fundamentally hard. So it's not like anyone can just take it and, and create a variant of it, right? I mean, when you're dealing with really complex autonomy algorithms and machine learning algorithms, there's a certain amount of expertise required. So the, the set of folks who can take that and do something with it is pretty small. Um, but there are a set of folks who can take that and do something with it. So I, I don't know. I, I don't have, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that. But I know it's something we've thought a lot about and have decided not to go down that road except in some limited circumstances. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sort of following up on that idea. Mm -hmm. Let's take Deer as your sort of prototypical outdoor, you know, robotic user. Sure. Do they try to make any mods, or do they just buy the thing off the shelf and, you know, use the menus or whatever? Yeah. So, so what we do with uh, customers like that um, is typically a, a sort of custom development, uh, but we negotiate IP rights that give them a certain level of 
uh, ownership within a certain field of use uh, and gives us licenses to use it in other areas. Uh, and we found most large companies when working with small companies are open to that because what I don't really want to become is, is what they call a butts and seats organization where I'm just selling billable time. Uh, you know, I hire a bunch of people and then I, you know, I pay them uh, $10 an hour but I bill them out at $14 an hour so I make that $4 an hour a profit. That's not the kind of company I want to build. Um, so I do pay some attention. We, we don't patent very much. We don't, uh, I don't personally believe in software patents very, very much. Um, so, uh, but we d are careful about IP in general. Yes. Um, so where do you find all your mentions that now you don't have yeah, I still have. Um, it's still a very good question. I have a couple of folks, uh, other entrepreneurs that uh, I've worked with that I reach out to sometimes, um, but that's a struggle. It, it's <sighs> Pittsburgh's a little bit hard for that. Um, they're the community's small here, so uh, and, and you know everybody, and, and I know a lot of the robotics. Uh, entrepreneurs here pretty well. Um, so in some cases I kind of know what their approach is going to be, what they're going to say, what they're going to think. Getting that fresh outside perspective is difficult. Uh, and I kind of wish I had, some, there are times I wish I had that. Any, any tips for like say new grads that Mentoring. Yeah, reach out to us. Uh, people like me, not just me, but there are a whole host of folks who are running robotics companies in Pittsburgh. Reach out to us. We're happy. I, I will speak for them and also say that pretty much all of us would be happy to talk to uh, folks who are interested in starting a company and, and sharing advice. And maybe what happens is, you know, kind of bootstrap that mentorship a little bit as well. Maybe, uh, maybe we should uh, give Paraga a rest. Uh, one more question. One more question, sure. One more question was... Uh... Sure, go ahead. Uh, how do you pick your patterns in terms of new areas that you want to go into? Uh, in, in terms of what? Areas? In terms of the areas you want to go into. Uh, early on, we went into everything. If I could, thought, if I thought I could win a proposal or a contract there, we went after it because we had to build breadth. Uh, now, a uh, couple of things I showed you uh, in a little depth where we had some, where I had some videos. Those are the things that we've decided to focus on because we see uh, other people are not doing things in those areas, um, and we see some requirements coming downstream uh, for those technologies. Uh, so, um, I, but we took a long time to get there. I was able to take a long time to get there because we had a steady stream of contract R&D money coming in. That's not always the case. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank All right. you. No, thank you. Thank you for thank having you. me. Um, yeah. Feel, feel free to reach out. My email address is up there. Email anytime. Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter too. So. <laughs> I know. I haven't seen him in forever. What's that? No. Oh, for near Earth? Nah. Hey, Greg. Hi. I want to introduce myself in person. I'm Sandy Wolf from Shadow Academy. 